All right, so you should have your notes that were um, left over from the gallbladder, or excuse me, the gastrointestinal lecture, and you should have the new notes on chemistry profile. So we'll finish up a test of the abdominal system today and discuss chemistry profiles, and then I have some case studies which will let us kind of apply those pieces. In the last lecture, we talked about how we could evaluate the pancreas, how we could look at the gallbladder. We looked at some of the symptoms of people who were at risk for gallbladder problems, those four or five Fs, fat, female, fertile, 40, and flatulent. Uh, and we talked about how the first test we might start with is just something as simple as an ultrasound. Today what I'd like to do is we'll look at some tests of the liver, and this is where, we, where I ended the last lecture. Liver function tests are usually abbreviated LFTs, and so in a patient's chart I might read elevated LFTs, and they expect that you would remember that represents liver function tests. I would expect liver function tests to be abnormal in patients who have had histories of hepatitis, who have history of alcoholism, um, who have uh, most of our medications, a lot of medications are broken down by the liver. And so if you read the warning on a Tylenol package, it tells you that one of the things that can happen if you take too much Tylenol is that it's hepatotoxic. It's damaging to the liver. And so people who overdose on Tylenol typically do not kill themselves. They just do massive damage to their liver. And when the liver is damaged by diseases like hepatitis or through drug use or alcohol, what happens is it releases certain enzymes into the system. And so as we look at liver function tests, we look at what does the liver do. The liver produces proteins such as albumin. The liver also produces fibrin, and so it plays a role in bleeding times. So the reason we're going to see this mentioned so many times in the patient's chart about liver function tests is if someone's liver is not working correctly, they are also at risk for having problems with edema because albumin is what keeps fluid kind of attracted inside the blood vessel. Um, albumin is a large protein molecule, and it has a tendency to have fluid stay with it. Uh, we look at those patients who have problems with their liver. They also usually have prolonged bleeding times. If I'm not producing enough fibrin, as we talked about coagulopathy and the ability to stop bleeding, hemostasis, if I don't have enough fibrin, my bleeding times will be prolonged. We looked at the gentleman's eyes on a previous um, lecture and said that when the body develops an increase in bilirubin, it usually indicates some problem with the liver because the liver is supposed to conjugate or change one form of bilirubin into another. So it usually takes indirect or um, non-conjugated bilirubin and makes it so that we can get rid of it in our urine. These ones are going to be enzyme levels. And so let's look at what some of those represent. So here's a test called ALP, and you've already learned that in medicine we love to shorten things to their initials, and on the lab report it will typically just put ALP, but it might also say alkaline phosphatase, and so you kind of need to remember um, those different things. As you read through this, and I'm not going to read it to you, what I will do is tell you some tips I use to help me remember. I'm going to use this L, which does not mean liver, but I'm going to use that L to help me remember that ALP is pretty much specific um, for one of the things that could cause it to elevate is liver. The other thing that could cause it to elevate is having a placenta present. So if you look at this, it says concentrations of ALP will go up if you have a placenta. So if you were pregnant, that could go up. It takes strong bones to climb the Alps. And so the other thing I remember the ALP elevates with is any damage to the bone. So ALP levels can elevate if there's a problem with the liver, if there's a placenta present, and it takes strong bones to climb the Alps. And so if there's bone disease, that can cause elevation of an ALP. So if you're a young woman who's 23 years old and you're pregnant and you go in and your ALP levels are elevated, they're not going to be as concerned as they would be if you were a 23-year-old young man 
who has no history of alcohol use, um, hepatitis, any of those things, and your ALP is elevated. That might indicate that you have some sort of involvement in the bone, such as bone cancer. So here we go. Serum ALP is also increased during some normal conditions. So our, our very first lecture, lecture one, we said there are some tests that are influenced by time of day, uh, by male, female, by geographic location. Here's one that just because if I'm going through puberty and I have a lot of bone growth going on, that could cause ALP to elevate. And there are a number of drugs that could cause this to elevate. So as we talked about that first lecture, we're not just going to do one test and use it all by itself to diagnose something. We usually combine and try to make a strong case just like an attorney would with what's going on with the person. So ALP elevate with liver damage, placenta present, or increased activity in the bone, such as bone cancer or something as innocuous as I'm going through a growth spurt. Here are another uh, mention of a test, an AST test. And an AST test is one that is not specific for the liver. If you look at your notes, it says it could also elevate if there's kidney damage. So here we have an ALT. It's not the same as the ALP. If you look in your notes, you have a mention of these, AST and ALT. And I want you to look for which of those is specific for the liver. So one of them is an enzyme that's only found in liver tissue. And so if it elevates, we know that the liver's involved. I hope that you've identified that is the ALT. And so the way I remember this one is this L does not stand for liver. But when I look at the lab reports, and I think, which one was it that was specific for the liver, that it's an enzyme only found in liver tissue? I use that L to help me remember that I'm there. Now, not to be confused with ALP. This is ALT and AST. The old names were SGOT and SGPT. You shouldn't see those around very much at all, but you might hear people still refer to them that way. The new and more correct names, AST and ALT. These are two liver function tests. They're enzymes that are released when there's damage. So let's look. If you look at the normals, units per liter, the normal levels for AST and ALT are a fairly normal range or a fairly low range. As we get acute injury, do you see the higher the number could indicate in acute processes that damage the liver that there's been a significant amount of tissue damage. So this is toxic, that person who took the overdose of Tylenol that's broken down by liver, or ischemic, they had a decreased blood flow to the, to the liver, so hepatic ischemia, and they have damaged the liver, and so the liver cells have released their enzyme, that ALT, into the system and their AST, and so we have these very elevated levels. So in acute conditions, look at these acute conditions, the numbers can tell us how severe or how much tissue has been damaged. The higher the number, the more tissue that's been damaged. However, look with chronic diseases. Think about if I've had a history of alcohol use over a number of years, do you imagine that, that initially I would have had very high levels? But now I've damaged so many of my liver cells over time that there's not that many healthy cells that could respond and release this ALT. And so it's not safe in every case to say the higher the level, the more damage there is. You can have very serious conditions with your liver, such as these two, chronic hepatitis or cirrhosis, which is scar tissue of the liver. And you can have just slightly elevated AST and ALT levels. So we're going to use other tests, too, to look at, at what does the liver look like, what's its density like, such as ultrasound or CAT scan to, to give us more information. But in acute conditions, we can use that rule. And acute is usually in most places defined as happening within the last three to five days. Okay, here's a patient who in 2000, I found this on the internet, um, they just posted their lab report, and I thought, that's pretty brave. They didn't remove any identifiers or anything. So I'm not violating any patient privacy because this person posted their lab report. And what we see here is you're going to see, whoops, 
the normal values over here and this person's values here. So it tells you they're a young male patient. And we come to the GGT. So if you look in your notes, see if you can find what GGT was for. And notice to see, is it one that's just specific for the liver? And what you'll identify is it is not. It is one that's found in other tissues in the body as well. Um, most of those would be things like liver, um, excuse me, like kidneys, um, some skin tissue, uh, skeletal tissue can have some GGT. Here is aspartate aminotransferase. What does that stand for? And alanine aminotransferase. So here is your AST. This is the fancy word that's for AST. Here's your ALT. And do you remember the trick I used? to help me remember which one of these was specific just for the liver. So this patient, the good news is their AST and ALT are within the normal range. Their GGT is elevated. And so it's probably not likely that it's the liver because the one that's liver specific, ALT, is not elevated. It might be something like cardiac tissue. It might be something like kidneys. Typically, if you have kidney damage, your AST will also start to elevate. But we may not have, um, it may be something that's happening um, just now. And it's not extreme, extremely elevated at this point. But it would be something that here we have one test that's abnormal, and we would watch that over time. All right, so with liver proteins, we have these proteins that are produced in the body. We have globulins that are produced. We have albumin that's produced. We have prealbumin that's produced. And we have some prothrombin that's produced all by the liver. And so if we have problems with the liver, we can also have problems with bleeding times being too long. And a person who has maybe edema, uh, we can measure protein levels. We can measure total protein levels. We can measure prealbumin in the blood. We can measure albumin in the blood. And so if a person has liver involvement, I might see that all those tests result in lower than normal levels. Now, where do you think you get protein? Well, you get it from the foods that you eat. So we could also see these things decrease because the person's not on an adequate diet. Here is a CAT scan of the liver. Liver can be evaluated with ultrasound, CAT scan, MRI. The liver should be a very dense organ, and this says cystic liver CAT scan. So the liver should look like this. Remember that things that are more dense should be white. Air and fluid should be more black. The liver should be pretty much entirely all this white. It should be very, very dense. And look at these areas that are hyperlucent or look more black on an x-ray. And you remember it's always as if the person was facing you, even in this case where they've laid down. They faced you and then they laid down. So here's their right side. And you remember from anatomy and physiology, your liver's on your right side. Here's their left side. And we've sliced them like a loaf of bread. We can see the backbone, the aorta. We're picking up some of the intestine. But we can see this liver over here that has some abnormal hyperlucencies or areas that are not as dense as they should be. That can be caused by fungal disease. It could be caused by um, fluid being where it shouldn't be. You could have an infection that would do this. You could have um, some scar tissue might result in backup of blood or other things that could cause that picture too. Here is an MRI. And you remember that magnetic resonance imaging shows much more detail of soft tissue and the liver would be a soft tissue. So again, we're kind of picking up, and these were done on a cadaver body. But can you see this abnormal density? These things right here would be blood supply. And they, as you can imagine, the liver has a lot of blood supply to it. The liver should be pretty much all the same consistency and density. And so look at this lesion or mass. And if I were to say, is this more solid than it should be or more liquid than it should be, less dense than it should be, you're going to remember air and fluid are more black. And this appears more black. So this is less dense than what it should be. So again, we have kind of a cystic, a fluid-filled mass on the liver. 
and they might biopsy that. Here's what your gallbladder might look at, like with gallstones in it, and those stones will be different colors depending on which they are, what they are formed by. If they're formed by cholesterol, they'll be more yellow like this. They can be black also because of cholesterol. Um, bile can make them more yellow. So you can have stones made of different things, and you can have different size stones. So this person's gallbladder was pretty much filled with stones. And that concern again is that these stones could lodge in the common bile duct. And then we have a block up of the pancreas. And the pancreas releases those digestive enzymes and has nothing to digest except itself. So ultrasound of the gallbladder. Here's a person with a big stone. That gallbladder can enlarge and get smaller. And here is that common bile duct. So you can see that this gallstone is sitting right across that duct. So they might use ultrasound or sound waves to break that up into small enough pieces that they could be collected. They might have to do a surgery and remove the gallbladder. So gallbladder disease, right upper quadrant pain. It radiates to the right scapula. The person that's kind of the characteristic person at risk for it, people use the four F's or the five F's. They're usually women. They're usually women who are overweight. They're women who are still premenopausal, so they're fertile. They're typically in their 40s, and they also have an increased amount of abdominal gas, and that comes from um, what the gallbladder does. It usually is that container that can kind of expand and contract, and if it's releasing all of its enzymes kind of at once into the system, or all of its waste products at once into the system, it kind of results in flatulence. And so those may be the things that go together. Because of our poor dietary habits, we're seeing many and many more younger people have problems with this. So now we have people, both male and female, in their 15s, their 20s, their early 20s, having problems with gallbladder disease. So the terms that went with this, cholecystitis, so the inflammation of the gallbladder, and cholelithiasis, the presence of having stones. So I might have cholecystitis not due to stones. It's less likely. But I could just have an inflamed gallbladder. Um, sometimes we hear of people who have sludge in their gallbladder. It's the waste product is just kind of accumulating and not emptying as well as it should. It's not making stones, but it's kind of making a sludge. So cholecystitis, inflammation of the gallbladder, and cholelithiasis, stones. Okay, a chemistry profile. So when we have a chemistry profile, what it is is a series of, it's a blood test that they're going to run a number of procedures on. So here is, we give it a name. I'm going to count on this table. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and there's three across. So this would be a Chem 21. And it's named a Chem 21 because you're going to evaluate 21 distinct items on that same sample of blood. So if you've been in the hospital or you've had blood drawn for lab work, you saw them use different color topped um, vials to collect that blood. When we do a chemistry profile, pretty much we just need a routine sample of blood, one that's going to have anticoagulant in it so that it won't clot, though. And with this Chem 21, let's look at the test that they're doing. So let's start with this one. We haven't had a lecture on diabetes yet that's coming up, but by checking your blood glucose level, I can screen you for diabetes or evaluate if your diabetes is progressing or improving. Here is a urea nitrogen, and because the chemistry profile is drawn from a blood sample, this is blood urea nitrogen. So here's BUN, and here's creatinine. So here's our renal profile. So by doing one test on one sample of blood, we've already learned about your risk of diabetes. If you're that healthy person who came in for a physical and we collected this blood sample, we've screened your kidney. We've done your urine or your renal profile. Now we come to sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium. The way this one's written, it's total CO2 or bicarbonate. I'm going to come down here. Here's phosphorus, 
and all of those would be electrolytes. The most common electrolytes we measure, sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarbonate. Calcium tells us about um, contractility. We looked at how all the electrolytes play a role in contractility, but calcium is especially important in cardiac contractility. If we have low calcium levels, my heart muscle doesn't work as well as it should. And so we've looked at electrolyte levels. Now we go to protein and albumin. Those would tell us about your diet and whether your liver is producing those proteins like it should. Then we look at your bilirubin levels, your ALP, here's that one that's screened for placenta, liver, it takes strong bones to climb the Alps and so it screens for bone cancer or something going on with your bone. AST, the one that's not specific for the liver, it's found in cardiac tissue, kidney tissue, so we're screening by looking at these enzyme levels to see do you have some undiagnosed uh, pathology or pathophysiology going on. Here's ALT, and remember I used that L to help me remember this is the one that's liver specific. So if my ALT is elevated, I know the liver has to be involved. If my AST is elevated and my ALT is not, then I know that the cause is not liver involvement. That's why we would combine those tests together. Amylase, that was one that is released from the pancreas. It was the one that was not specific. Lipase was pancreas specific. Amylase also came from those parotid glands um, up kind of on the side of your cheeks under the skin. We have LDH and we haven't talked about these two yet. And when we get to our cardiac lecture, we'll talk about all of these four things here. LDH is an enzyme that's released. That's more likely to increase when there's cardiac tissue damage, similar to what CPK does, creatinine phosphokinase. These enzymes will elevate if you have a cardiac involvement, so a myocardial infarction. Triglycerides and cholesterol in your blood put you at risk for cardiac disease, so those would screen for your risk of having a myocardial infarction. I've already mentioned phosphorus, and ketones kind of goes with this glucose one. If we don't have carbohydrates that our bodies can burn for energy, if they do get to the point where they burn fat, the waste product of that fat burning is ketones. So if I was trying to lose weight, I might want my blood ketone levels to be elevated, but if I have not been diagnosed with diabetes and I'm trying to lose weight, um, it might be that I have undiagnosed diabetes, if there's ketones in my blood. Alright, so let's see how we might use this. Here's a Chem 27, and I apologize for kind of the quality of this, but sometimes when I enlarge them so that you can see them good enough on the screen, well enough on the screen, they lose some of that nice crispness, but here's a Chem 27, so what would that mean? Well, there's 27 different tests that they've done. What kind of things did they look for? So here's ALP, ALT, here's the old name, SGPT, AST, um, SGOT, here's CK, creatinine kinase, GGT, so the ones I want you to focus on for this week are the ones that we looked at with the liver. We looked at ALP, ALT, AST, GGT. We looked at albumin, total protein. We looked at, here's another protein molecule, globulin. Here's bilirubin, and this is the total bilirubin together, and here's the good bilirubin. Indirect would be the bad bilirubin. Here's BUN and creatinine, so the renal profile, we've had those in a previous lecture. We'll have lectures coming up on cholesterol levels and glucose levels. Here's our electrolytes, we've already discussed those. Here's anion gap ratio, so somebody's, they looked at an anion gap type of calculation. Here's a bilirubin ratio. Here's a sodium to potassium ratio, and then they actually calculated the anion gap. T4, we're going to have a lecture on endocrine glands and we'll talk about thyroid studies. This one looks for thyroid disease or problems with your thyroid gland. So now let's go back and we have the normals in this column to the right of your screen. 
we can easily tell, just like the patient could, we have high and low values here. And let's look at what might be going on with the patient. Here's a very increased ALP level. So typically, in acute diseases, the higher the level, the more tissue that's been damaged. Here's an ALT that's elevated. Here's a GGT that's elevated. So what kind of thing could we use to describe what's going on here? What do we think might be happening in the body to cause those levels to elevate? Um, because the ALT is elevated, we know the liver has to be involved because this is the only place that the enzymes produce is in the liver. So when it's elevated, we do have liver tissue damage. This one, ALP, we know that it was caused to be elevated by other things. It could be liver, so it may just be the liver doing that entire thing. GGT is not one that's liver specific. It could also be cardiac or renal tissue. So we know that the liver is involved. There might also be involvement with cardiac tissue, and that's why it might help to look at this CK. The one that's more cardiac specific is not elevated. So perhaps all of these are due to liver involvement. If the liver's involved, we might see the proteins start to fall. And do you see that they're still within their normal range, so maybe this is just an acute process. We come to bilirubin. The bilirubin is elevated, the total bilirubin. The direct bilirubin is elevated, and for it to be this number, we also know that there's um, 0.3 of indirect bilirubin, and that would also be a little bit increased. The person does have an increased risk of cardiac disease. Their cholesterol is elevated above what it should be. Um, their chloride is lower than it should be. Their anion gap ratio is lower than it should be. And their anion gap is high. So we'd expect they have an acidosis if we could see their pH. That's the reason for doing an anion gap calculation. And they have included potassium in their formula. All right, so we know that this person's got something going on with their liver that appears to be acute, and I'm going to say that because this is pretty elevated, and we don't have involvement of the protein yet. We do have some involvement with the bilirubin. Here's another chemistry profile, and let's look at this one. The BUN and creatinine are very elevated. So this person either has acute renal failure or chronic renal failure, uh, their body is not clearing these waste products like it should. It could be that they just have an increase in waste products, but it's more likely that they have a problem with the kidneys getting rid of the waste product. Chemistry profiles are done on blood samples, and so we have um, an involvement with the kidneys. It's not unlikely that if the kidneys are involved, we have problems with electrolytes. And phosphorus is a mineral that also can be regulated by the kidneys. Okay, here's a chemistry profile. This is what the newer ones will look like. They're computer-based. And so I don't have the normals out here for you. If I were sitting at my computer terminal, I would click on this value that I could tell is abnormal because it's bolded here, but on my screen it would appear yellow as well. Or, or red. And so I would know, click on that, I could see the normal value. I will tell you that this is slightly higher than what it should be. This one was a little bit lower than what it should be. So the glucose, that's not unusual to watch glucoses trend up and down in patients that are in an intensive care unit because they're undergoing a lot of stress. And to remember your fight and flight mechanism, your um, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems cause glucose either to be released or to be stored. We do have a slightly elevated BUN and a slightly elevated creatinine. So this person might have some kidney involvement. And now that I'm saying that, I'm wondering. Yeah. These are actually slightly low. And so I don't know that we'd put a whole bunch of worry into those. We're more concerned when they're elevated. When we come to their phosphorus, this one is running a little bit low, and phosphorus is um, part of that positive and negative charged um, electrolyte system. When you have hypophosphatemia, 
you can have some problems with nerve conduction. We were more concerned about hyperphosphatemia, causing maybe paralysis of muscles. Here's AST and ALT. This one is within its normal range. This one is slightly elevated. Um, total protein is a little bit lower than what it should be. Globulin is a little bit lower than it should be. And these are protein molecules. These are ones that are produced by the liver. So is the liver involved? Which of these tests was specific for the liver? You remember there was only one that's found in liver tissue and that is the ALT and the ALT for this person is normal. So the AST is elevated. That could be due to cardiac tissue. It could be due to renal tissue. It could be due to skeletal tissue damage. Yes, their protein levels are low. Maybe their diet. Maybe they're nothing by mouth and we're giving them just IVs and we're controlling their diet. Their bilirubin is a little bit high and so they, they this may be the end of an acu uh, process or something. Maybe we're seeing the end of it instead of the beginning of it. Okay, so now what I have for you is some case studies for you to kind of practice from lectures one through six. When we looked at CBC results, we said we were looking at is there infection or inflammation? What's their ability to transfer oxygen? We said that the red blood cells also play a minor role in acid-base balance. We had the red blood cell indices and with a CBC we get a platelet and so we kind of have an initial idea as far as the, the body's ability to stop bleeding. So what's wrong with this person? And the asterisks tell you to kind of look at that item and evaluate it closer. Is there evidence of infection or inflammation? You should be able to answer that question now. So I want you to talk to your screen, talk in your head. Is there evidence of inflammation or infection? What does the body typically do when there's infection or inflammation? It increases the amount of white blood cells that we have. But the reason we have a lower value on this end is you can also lose the battle. So we're concerned if your white blood cell counts too low or if it's too high. So this person does have evidence of infl inflammation or infection as evidenced by their increased white blood cell count. They have a lower than normal red blood cell count. Do you remember the name of that? So when I had too few of red blood cells, what was the term that we used? We call it anemia. When we had too many white blood cells, white blood cells were called lymphocytes or leukocytes. Do you remember to keep those straight? They were leukocytes, so we had a leukocytosis, and we could call this an erythropenia or erythrocytopenia, but the more correct term was anemia. There was a trend between what the red blood cell did and what the hemoglobin did and what the hematocrit did, and that was that if the red blood cell count is low, because hemoglobin is the primary component of red blood cells, it would also be low. And because red blood cells are the primary blood solid, and hematocrit is a ratio of solids to liquids, it would also be low. When we had the lecture on red blood cells, we talked about the pattern between hematocrit and hemoglobin. That there's typically, if I know the hemoglobin, I could multiply it by three to estimate hematocrit. If I know the hematocrit, I could divide it by three and estimate the hemoglobin. And there are clinically relevant times that we do that. Sometimes we just take a blood sample and do hematocrit. So we could estimate that. We said when you donate blood, they're doing a hematocrit. So they're estimating, do you have enough hemoglobin to donate blood that day? The red blood cell indices may call it tell us about the cause or type of anemia. This person doesn't have any abnormalities and so that tells us their red blood cells are the right shape, they're the right size, they have the right amount of hemoglobin on them. And so the problem is not something to do with the shape or size of the red blood cell or they're probably not hypochromic anemia which would cause less hemoglobin on the red blood cell. They may have something just like uh, due to bleeding, so maybe they have hemorrhagic anemia. All right, platelet count is very, very low, should be in the 100,000s, and they only have 17,000. So this would put this person at risk for bleeding. Um, we said you might see a case like this if there's something going on with the bone marrow, but their bone marrow must be a 
able to work if they're producing white blood cells. So this is probably not that example of the person who had all blood lines reduced. Here's the differential that goes with that patient. So all I've done is carry over this 15.2 total and that means thousands per deciliter blood per liter of, or per 100 mils of blood and their neutrophil count was within the normal range their band count is elevated do you remember if when the band count is elevated do we call that a right shift or a left shift so try and answer the questions that I ask so bands elevate we call it a right shift and a right shift indicates an acute infection Bands and neutrophils protect us against all types of infection, but they primarily will elevate when there is a bacterial infection. The lymphocyte count is low, but you remember these have to total 100. They're percentages, and so when one cell count increases, or two or three increase, something is going to have to go down. And so we're probably less concerned about the decrease in lymphocyte, and we use the terms relative and absolute. Sorry about my phone going off there. There is an absolute increase in bands, and due to that, we have a decrease in lymphocytes. That's our most likely explanation based on the normal response of the body. All right, monocytes are elevated. Do you remember what would cause them to elevate? So neutrophils and bands typically are bacterial infections. Lymphocytes, viral infection. Monocytes were fungal infection. And eosinophils were allergic reactions. So maybe we have a whole bunch of different types of infection present in this person. Basophils typically elevated if there was some sort of blood cancer process, like a leukemia. Okay, coagulation studies. And again, when I make it big, sometimes I lose the nice crispness. But here is protime and an INR and a PTT and something that looks a specific um, blood product, fibrinogen that's needed to form that clot. Remember, to form a stable clot, we needed fibrinogen. Antithrombin, well, a thrombin is a clot, and so antithrombin, we all have enzymes in our bodies that break clots down. A platelet count, we know that platelets were the initial piece of that clot. So we had constriction, we had platelets come into that area to form an initial platelet plug, we had um, the clotting enzymes come in, we had the um, clotting factors, we had fibrinogen and fibrin to come in and form that stable um, plug at the end. Okay, so what's going on with this person then? I can tell you that these levels, the pro time is elevated, the INR normal is 1. Remember we said kind of a quick and dirty rule for INR is if your INR is 1, it takes you the normal amount of time to stop bleeding as it does a patient who's not on any blood medications. An INR of 2, in a quick and dirty rule, means it's taking two times as long to stop bleeding as a normal person. Your PTT levels are elevated. Your fibrinogen count is low. So your fibrinogen levels are falling and your platelet count should be in the 100,000s and it's low. This antithrombin is um, also a little bit elevated. Okay, so let's look at this then. The person has longer bleeding times than they should. It's both the PTT and the PT. Pro time is PT. So they must be receiving heparin and Coumadin or Warfarin. That could cause this picture. It may also be they have that condition that results in bleeding. Do you remember what that was called, where we have abnormal clotting in the blood vessels at the same time they're bleeding? That was called diffuse or disseminated intravascular coagulation or coopath co yeah. Intervag <laughs> now I can't say anything. Intravascular coagulopathy. And so we could have a person who has DIC. That person who is getting better and now all of a sudden they're starting to bleed everywhere at the same time they're clotting everywhere. And maybe we've tried to treat it by giving them heparin. 
So this person has a lot of disturbances in their ability to stop bleeding. There are disturbances that they take way too long to stop bleeding compared to a normal person who's not on medications like heparin or Coumadin. Okay, we looked at procedures that would evaluate the intestine area. We called it a KUB radiograph, but we also had one that we injected dye into the vein and we watched it come through to see how the kidneys were actually working. If I look at this film, I actually see the contrast media. I can see dye here in the bladder. I can see the kidneys have had that come through. The dye has come through. And so I know that this one's not just a KUB film because the KUB doesn't have the contrast in the kidneys. This one is an IVP, an intravenous pilogram. And they would have done this procedure to evaluate how the kidneys are functioning. It's not without its risk because anytime we put that dye into the body, we risk damaging the kidneys because they get rid of that as a waste product. So we would have really wanted to collect this information. I said kidney stones may be frequent urinary infection in a male patient. We want to look at the anatomy of the ureters or to see whether those kidneys are doing their job. We can see this one seemed to work better than the one on the left. Remember, it's always as if the person's facing you. The last thing we could do is have the person void. That means go to the bathroom and we could watch it through the urethra. Okay, here's an IVP and they show a big tumor over here where the bladder should be kind of a big round ball. This person had a bladder tumor. This one was a cystoscopy and we said anytime we use that term oscopy we're using a scope to go into a body orifice. So cystoscopy going into the bladder, why would you want to do that? Well, it's probably not going to be for kidney stones is it? because that scope is not going to be go up there into the urethra or into the ureters and up into the kidneys. This is for the bladder and so we might suspect some sort of bladder cancer or prostate problems. Remember we can get brushing, washing, or biopsies through that scope, through channels in that scope. So here's one reason we might want to do it. Here's a normal as we go down to the urethra. Then we could see the prostate and you could see how that can impinge on the ure urethra and not allow there to be good urination. So on the commercials where it talks about an enlarged prostate, it said, do you have a problem where you go just little amounts or your stream flow is not very high? What's the name of this procedure? So I can see the backbone. I can see the hip bones, the pelvis. I can see a lot of air. And I can see some ribs. So this one is the KUB film, kidneys, ureter, and bladder. And that gets confusing because you say, I don't really see the kidneys, ureter, and bladder. And this one, I can kind of see the bladder down here. But the KUB is done to look at those body parts, look at the structure. So a KUB film can be done just as likely to look at intestines in that area. It's to look at that portion of the body. But it gets kind of confusing between IVP and KUB. KUB, kidneys, ureter, and bladder makes me think I should look at that and see those. And so if I see them, it should be a KUB film, but I just told you no, that's not incorrect. It's an IVP when you can see the contrast. Why somebody's really trying to get a hold of me, aren't they? All right, why would this test be ordered? So this person has, this is it, their stomach. They've swallowed some contrast or we've put it down there with a gastric tube. We then manipulate them or manipulate the table they're laying on so that that contrast media can coat that entire stomach. And so this would be ordered to look at that stomach lining and that would be to look for ulcers. It could also look for reflux. We could watch what should stay in the stomach and see if it comes back up into the esophagus. That would test for reflux. What is this procedure? Now they've put contrast media into the rectum and connected to the rectum would be the large bowel typically. This is for an infant so their large bowel is not as big as with an adult but can you see all this trapped air up here too? So they've had some bowel issues. This is a lower GI or a barium enema. 
These are cysteine stones. They were found in a person's kidney. So what kind of symptoms do we have when you have kidney stones? Remember it was flank pain, usually one-sided, because it was unlikely we passed stones at both sides at once. And it would knife-like sharp pain, intense to the point that they say it's comparable to having child, to bearing a child. So sharp flank pain. What procedure is this? And I know the quality of this one can throw you a little bit. This is a kidney. So we kind of get these grainy images, and this is an ultrasound of the kidney. Ultrasound procedures could be used of liver. There's your liver up here, kidney, gallbladder, uh, spleen, pancreas, uh, appendix. And we do these ultrasounds to tell us about density and shape. Can't really tell us if it's working or not, but it can tell us the density and shape. What's the difference between lymphocytosis and leukocytosis? So which one means an increased white blood cell count? That was lymphocytosis. And leukocytosis would be an increase in a type of white blood cell. Leukocytes, monocytes, basophils, neutrophils. Leukocytes were a type of white blood cell. So I'll let you read this one. Think of the tests that we'd be doing if the person's on Coumadin. Can you do that trick of 10 or the rule of 10 to decide if they should be doing PTs or PTTs? So because they're on Coumadin, C-O-U-M-A-D-I-N, I have two fingers left out of 10, they would be doing PT tests. And this person is saying, I have doctors telling me different things. So think about why would their nose bleed or their teeth, their gums bleed when they brush their teeth because of what's happening, because of the medication they're taking. So he said lay people say Coumadin is a blood thinner. What it actually does is make the blood slipperier, not likely used to stick together as much. The person's on that because they have a condition, atrial fibrillation, which puts them at risk for blood clots because those atria don't empty as well as they should. There's some blood that kind of stays more static and it's at risk for clotting. So they are on the right medication, but maybe they're on too much if they're doing simple things like this and they're getting bleeding. And so can you bet that patients who are put on Coumadin or Warfarin are told if they see a lot of bruising on their body or if they notice that they're bleeding just doing simple things, that may mean that their blood levels need to be checked. And uh, these things could change. I think when we had this lecture I mentioned how just how they how much green leafy vegetables or green vegetables they eat can change these levels. Here's another patient. What might be wrong with them? So dear lab values class, what might be wrong with me? What do you think is wrong with this person based on their symptoms? And what tests would help us determine that? So if they're waking up with a bitter taste in their throat and they have heartburn symptoms, that sounds like GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And with GERD, that makes us think that we need to do procedures, sometimes with this one, because the treatment is not that oh, risky. It's not that life-threatening, the medication we give you. Maybe all we do is treat you as if you have reflux. Uh, we might do things like the upper GI. We might do something like the pH probe study. But it's just as likely all we'll do is put you on something for reflux. Which one matches? So this one, the diverticuli. Remember diverticuli, if I was in the intestine, a diverticuli would look like a cave. Things could get trapped in it. So this one, I have them blocked and inflamed. This one, I have the presence of the diverticuli. So itis means inflammation or infection. 
that goes with definition two. Diverticulosis, I have diverticuli, but I just have gas and diarrhea. But my physicians told me if I have um, pain that increases in my abdomina, abdominal area or if I start to have problems with evacuating my bowels, maybe then I have moved to diverticulosis or from diverticulosis to diverticulitis. So this one is more um, concerning, but people who have diverticulosis are at risk for progressing to diverticulitis. Okay, and we're just about done here. This person's been diagnosed with an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So their body is recognizing their own blood as abnormal. The doctors put them on an anti-inflammatory medication, a prescription one called prednisone. It's a steroid drug. And the tests they would do, here we go with anemia. They have too few red blood cells. If it's hemolytic anemia, we would just see a decrease in their red blood cell count. And with autoimmune um, anemia, and because they're on pre prednisone, they would do uh, sed rate tests. Sed, the sed rate, remember, looked at how quickly those red blood cells kind of clump together and settle. Uh, they would monitor this patient's sed rate to help them decide maybe if they're on enough prednisone or not enough. And this is a person that even on treatment is probably getting some sort of transfusion. What is leukopenia? So now we don't have lymphopenia, we have leukopenia, so their white blood cell count is decreased. What could cause it? Why would I have too few of white blood cells? Well, that might be that I have um, I'm undergoing cancer treatment, either radiation or chemotherapy, the drug therapy. It could be that my body is losing the battle with infection and I'm so overwhelmed. The toxins that were released by the bacteria or funguses or I guess fungi would be the plural. Uh, they have overwhelmed my bone marrow and released toxins that are causing it not to work correctly. We might give them granulocyte colony stimulating factor injections. Those usually go into the belly or the, the thigh muscle on the leg. Or we could give them white blood cell transfusion. We said some people call that buffy coat because of its color. I'll let you read this one and I'll try and decide what's wrong with this person. So, is it any wonder that they have increased liver enzymes? Every time you drink alcohol, your liver is damaged to some degree. Typically, if you don't consume much alcohol, if you stay within what's considered those normal safe ranges, you do damage, but it's low enough that the liver can kind of recover. But this person is to the point where we would probably call them an alcoholic and their liver enzymes are elevated, should they worry? You bet. Could they have hepatitis? Yes, an infection of the liver. Um, and so they should probably be screened for things like that. Uh, but we would also follow up with them, maybe say, could you quit drinking for a while? Let's see if your liver enzymes go back to normal. We might do an ultrasound. Here's a person who had a low hemoglobin. It doesn't say if they're a male or a female. For a male, their hemoglobin level should be 14 to 16, 14 to 18 maybe. For a female, it can be down to 12. But either way, this is a pretty low level. We said most places would transfuse if your level gets to 6. So do you think it's really going to be enough that they would eat more red meat? We seem to be treating a symptom if we do this too. Huh, where are the red blood cells going? Has this person got a bleeding ulcer? Have they got esophageal varices? So are they really an alcoholic and they have dilated or do they have cirrhosis of the liver and they have those dilated um, veins that are lining their esophagus and maybe they have one that's ruptured and they're bleeding? So the doctor should have said, what do your stools look like? Are they black and tarry? Remember, if blood entered the digestive system high up, it resulted in those black tarry stools, and we'd want to do uh, maybe a guaiac. And even if we don't know if there's blood there, the stool guaiac, the whole purpose of it was to find hidden or occult blood. So what do we think of this approach? 
one, you're probably not going to increase your hemoglobin very much just by eating red meat. This person is pretty low. Two, the biggest issue is you're treating a symptom instead of identifying where is the where are, are the red blood cells going. How about this one? You have anemia and so you take iron, right? Because nails are made of iron, but this is not iron that you can digest. If you imagine that you swallowed ground up nails, most of it is just coming right through your bowel. And I think this should be the last one. Here's a woman who, even though she cuts her food into small pieces, she seems to have problems swallowing. And so we could do an upper GI, or we could focus on the piece that we're interested in, the swallow piece, the swallow evaluation. We put them inside a fluoroscopy, a moving x-ray, while they swallow that contrast media, and we watch how that esophagus processes that contrast media. Okay, hemorrhoids and polyps. Polyps are on the inside, usually in the colon. If I were standing in the intestine, a polyp would look like a wart protruding into that. Um, with hemorrhoids, I um, have them on the outside of me, and they're usually more minor. I might do surgery if they were bleeding or extra large. With polyps, they could be cancerous or become cancerous over time as they're constantly irritated. And so uh, surgery could be necessary for either condition. Let me see how many slides I put in here. I put quite a few, and so I'm going to wrap up this lecture. But you should be able to kind of look through based on the lectures we've done and answer these. If you have questions, you're welcome to post those to the discussion board, and I will be happy to answer those. But you have, we've gone over this information. You should be able to come through and answer most of these questions on your own. All right. So let me end this. Um, remember, you can take your exams two times if you'd like to. I'm also willing, if you've sat here and listened to this entire lecture, if you've missed any of the previous quizzes, this is like um, the free library return day where they say if you've had books you kept, return them now. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to take any quiz that you've missed. All you'd have to do is email me. Thank you very much.